Welcome back to part two of my ozone and redox reactions video. So redox means oxidation, react oxidation reduction reactions. We'll do some experiments. I'll bring all these things closer to me and put them in little vials just to show you how to analyze things at home if, if you want to geek out on chemistry or just to see this and understand it basically for yourself. But of course, if you're a professional, you should be able to understand these things a lot more and be much more aware of them to analyze what can go into the human body, what can be used outside the human body, how much oxidation is enough and how, and, and how oxidation and reduction reactions work inside the biochemistry, especially when we're fighting infections. We all produce free radical oxygen or peroxide or superoxide free radicals basically to attack bacteria and viruses and kill this is what our white blood cells do to kill invaders and pathogens so we should be able to help the human body modulate that it's all about awareness and modulation that's what balancing is that's what health is health is a, is a constant flowing state of the ability to balance back the balancing activity which is awareness and modulation something's up something's down at different times too much oxidation is bad no oxidation as in too much antioxidants is also bad for example with vitamin c you want to take two one and a half or, or, two, or two grams a day regularly that's fine of good quality ascorbates with magnesium and with zinc however you don't want to be taking 10 grams a day orally one you don't make use of most of that because most of it will just become diarrhea and it will just go out because it has to go through the digestive tract but also too much antioxidants for too long is not good However, when you come to inject IV vitamin C, yes, to maintain health, if you're generally healthy, you will inject maybe two, maybe three grams, and that's fine. But if you're really sick, like with the COVID-19 or whatever, you'll inject 20 grams, not you will inject. A professional, a, a doctor will, will, who's trained in vitamin C and believes in that, will inject 15 to 20 grams IV. That, sur that surpasses and bypasses the whole digestive tract, doesn't cause diarrhea or anything like that, and it's all bioavailable for your body to use. However, at that concentration, an IV, it does not become an antioxidant. It becomes an immune modulator. It actually causes your body to produce more superoxide and, per and peroxide free radicals to attack the viruses more. It's a whole different change of biochemistry, concentrations, applications, when and for who and for what. It's very different. Same thing with ozone and iodine and peroxide and chlorine, which is what we're gonna be talking about here today. I'm not talking about the vitamin C anymore. So I showed you already in the other video, the, my homemade disinfection chamber, ozone disinfection chamber for masks and, and uh, tools. As long as it has a breaker, make sure it has a, an ozone breaker, basically a de an ozone deconstructor. The medical grade uh, ozone and high quality home grade ozone as well. And I showed you the ozone taps, the ozone taps in the water. So let's see how all these things interact with each other and which ones we can use on the skin, in the mouth, into the, underneath the gums, for example, or inject or not inject and so on and so forth. See you in a minute. Welcome back. So in dentistry, for example, when I teach colleagues how to do laser assisted periodontal treatment, we won't talk about lasers right now. I always teach a whole protocol. Part of that is rinsing with ozone. You can also flush with ozone. However, the, the activity of, of rinsing, obviously, doesn't get anything below the gum line. It doesn't go in between the teeth and all these things. So it, it is limited in, in access and accessibility. So I teach everyone to use iodine, basically betadine. So iodine drops in a little bit of profi paste and you polish the teeth and the gums. You're actually scrubbing with it because this is how iodine works. So you can't just rinse with iodine and expect it to disinfect deeply because it does not penetrate. It's very safe iodine, but it doesn't penetrate. It has to be scrubbed on. That's why when you have any kind of surgery, before they cut you open, anywhere in the body, they scrub you with iodine. They don't put it on, they scrub you with it. The surgeons, we wash our hands and then we scrub with iodine as well. It has to be scrubbed on. So iodine to actively work has to be scrubbed so that you can agitate and also break down the biofilm, thin it out so it can come in contact. Then it becomes a very strong antibacterial and also antiviral uh, as well. Uh, things like we have Totorol in our products. It's, it's a plant fiber, obviously, it's a, from, from the Totoro tree, and that's highly antiviral, but also has to be scrubbed in. That's, that's an, another thing altogether. Let's, let's not go into there right now. 
other things that can be used inside the math, like I said before in the other in the beginning of the first video, are hydrogen peroxide. So peroxide is very good to kill viruses and uh, many bacteria, especially anaerobic bacteria. However, because it's acidic, peroxide has a pH of about 4.5, sometimes 4, sometimes a little bit. Anyway, 4, 4 to 4.5. So it's a bit acidic and it's highly reactive in terms of a bubbling reaction. It's very reactive with organic matter. Now that's really good when we flush inside the gum line with it because the bubbling action, as I'll show you in the experiments very soon, is very good because it remo helps remove debris as well. So we use 3% peroxide and flush inside, that's very good. However, you never, ever, ever inject hydrogen peroxide at any concentration directly into the human body, whether it's sub subcutaneous, submucosal, as we do in dentistry, or subcutaneous and, uh, you know, in, skin injections basically, or intravenous. Never ever because of that hyperreactivity and it's always an exothermic reaction. Heat gets produced as well. Very bad. Don't inject it, inject it but flush with it. If you're going to use peroxide as a math rinse or to wash hands, you can use 1% and it's still effective. Not as effective as 3%, but it's not as caustic as 3%. If, if I, this is, which one? This is peroxide. If, if I put peroxide on my finger, like this, you don't see that the bubbles forming because it's not, it's not a lot, but I can feel it already on my finger. It's starting to break down the skin. Very good for removing your fingerprints, by, by the way, if you want to become a very good thief. Anyway, <laughs> that's a whole different thing. So peroxide cannot be used all the time as a scrub or as a rinse because it can be quite a strong irritant. And if you go below 1%, it's not, it's not effective. If you go above 1%, it's it's, it can start getting caustic, so about 1% is fine for general rinsing or washing. Just be careful with that irritability. Uh, obviously, Janola bleach, never ever drink that, never flush into the gums, never flush your mouth, never inject it, never do anything like that with it. This is a whole different story. This is for outside the human body, cleaning and disinfection and all that. Very alkaline, this is physiologically alkaline. This is an oxidizing alkaline matrix that, that I make, of course, safe to ingest safe within any part of the human body. Alkaline to pH 8, not acidic and not super alkaline, obviously non-caustic and much, much lower concentrations of the active oxidizing agents yet at the same efficacy. So we're talking about a thousand parts per million, 1% is 10,000 parts per million and with ozone, as we, we talked in the other video, we're talking about four parts per million to get that oxidation effect. So very, very different, but you can't store ozone. So we ozonate our water when we make our math rinse in the factory and when we make the, um, the serum, all the water is filtered and ozonated to disinfect the water. But there is no ozone in this bottle anymore after half an hour from making, making the product. So we can't sell you ozone, we just use it to disinfect. What we're, what's stable inside the oxidizing agent is sodium chloride. That works differently. We'll, we'll look at the effectiveness of all these things in a second and we're going to use potassium iodide because it gives us a color change when it gets oxidized. So the iodine gets released when it gets oxidized. So you'll see how fast and slow the reactions are. Also, I'm going to use some uh, pH dye to show you instead of using a pH meter, because that takes longer, pH dye is colored so you can see the changes in color with what I was talking about, acidity and pH, and how ozone, for example, does not change the pH of the water. It does not make it acidic or more alkaline, it just keeps it whatever it is. So usually it's around 7, 7.5, which is the pH of water, basically, the neutral pH, and that's the pH of blood as well. So this does not change pH, and this is the chemistry that I was talking about in the first video. Chemistry versus biochemistry. All these things I was talking about, pH, oxidative power, whether it gives oxygen or it steals an electron, that's an oxidizing agent basically. All these things are chemical properties, that's chemistry. So all these things are oxidizing agents, but they have different pHs, that's different parts of the chemistry. Some are stronger than the others, so they overpower the others. Like chlorine will all, always overpower iodine as an oxidizing agent. Uh, fluorine, one of the most toxic agents to, hu to, to humanity or any, any, any living matter, is, is the strongest oxidizing agent. It steals electrons from everything that it can and always forms acids. That's why fluorine and fluorine products, other than being toxic to humans, they break down ozone, even though ozone is a very strong uh, oxidizing agent. Fluorine, like hydrofluorocarbons, example. Hydro H HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, science, we use them in 
refrigeration, in, in, in disinfection, in many, other, in many other things, until we destroyed our ozone layer that's protecting us from UV in, in the air. We, we stopped using those fluorinated substances. It's not the hydrogen or the carbon that's destroying the ozone, it's the fluorine, hydrofluorocarbons. So fluoride in the water, fluoride in products, fluoride in the air, toxic, 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 because it's the most supreme, badly oxidizing agent that, that we know of. It steals electrons from everything. So it will oxidize chlorine, it will oxidize iodine, it will oxidize everything else, as an example. Again, this is all chemistry and variations in the chemistry. What we're talking about, or what we want to make sense out of, is how to use them in biochemistry and in biology to enhance healing, uh, clean, disinfect safely, but also treat and help humans heal. Let's talk about that and show you some real life examples here. So let's do some tests with, so this is the, the Janola. If you put a, basically hypochlorite, you put a, a drop of the reagent in there and it's very dark blue, pH usually about nine to 10. Very dark blue is high, very high pH. This one here is the peroxide. This is the hydrogen peroxide. Like I said, pH 4 to 4.5, red, acidic. So oxidizing agent is one part of their chemistry. Their pH is another part of their chemistry. Their interactions with everything else is a whole different uh, aspect, again, of chemistry. Interaction with the human body, human cells, and, and, and viruses and bacteria. That's yet another level of interactions that we need to talk about. And that's not chemistry, that's biochemistry and quantum biology. So, which one is next? This one here is a hand spray, hand sanitizer, which is more concentrated than, than my math rinse, but it's the same core oxidizing ingredient. So we're gonna use that here. And the pH of that is eight to 8.5. I know that because I designed it to be so. so alkaline. Iodine obviously is dark anyway, so we're not gonna test the pH of that, it's fine. And let's do some other testing now. Reactions, let's look at reactions. So how does hydrogen peroxide react with chlorine, for example? We know that this is the chlorine, so let's add some more in there. The hypochlorite, basically. And when you put a little bit of peroxide in there, you can see the reaction very, very quickly releasing the oxygen. That will not happen with the ozone. I'll show you that later. However, when you put it with, for example, my math rinse, the peroxide, it also does not react in the same way. So that you can never inject into human body, this combination. That's very dangerous. We'll go bring it nearby. That's a whole different story. No, again, it's not for injection, but I'm just saying. Let's use a very simple home reagent test to check if your oxidizing agent is working and potassium iodide is a very good way to do that. Of course, you can get test strips and many other professional things to do that. But with this one, you can do it quite at home and safely and easily. And also, it shows you how quickly that reaction happens. You don't want it to happen too quickly. You want slow. So when you're injecting, for example, the ozone, as we will talk about safety again, you want that breakdown of ozone to oxygen and that oxidation process to happen nice and slow in, inside the body. You don't want to react like peroxide and, and chlorine and everything else and, and become caustic inside the body. So this is the hypochlorite. So we're gonna put the hypochlorite in there and add some of the potassium iodide into it. Immediately, the chlorine reacts with the potassium iodide, displacing the iodine out. And that's what you can see here. When we smell it, you don't actually smell chlorine, you smell iodine. That's a very quick reaction, but shows strong oxidation. Peroxide. This is the hydrogen peroxide. I'll just do it by hand. Very professional here. And you can see it's not just a quick reaction, but it's also exothermic. It's a bubbling reaction. 
this is this is a very cool way chemistry teachers uh, show their students how to make bubbly soap and all that they would use 10 20 30 percent peroxide and potassium iodide and just just blasts off we're using only th three percent here so don't do don't do that at home uh, with 30 percent peroxide 30 percent peroxide is very very caustic anyway so that's the reaction with that this is the reaction with my sodium chloride containing oxidizing spray or bath rinse so we want to check is it oxidizing yes it is but with that an exothermic reaction with that bubbling and at a slower pace and then we'll do the ozone as well so you can see it's nice and slow nice and gentle it's happening but nice and slow and nice and gentle okay not as potent as this i'm actually put less iodide in there and it's still a much darker color it's displacing all the iodide and this one is still bubbling the peroxide this one no bubbling just gentle slow oxidation it smells nice actually now let's see the ozone what happens with the ozone let's put a little bit of water in there dissolve our potassium iodide in there potassium iodide obviously is, is food this is uh, what they put in iodized salt it's very bitter if you taste it like this it's very bitter uh, to help us replenish our missing iodine in our diet. We're all deficient in iodine, so taking iodine drops, taking potassium iodide in one form or another is very good for, for, for the body because we're all deficient in iodine in one way or another. We need iodine or iodide to be more specific, not iodine gas, but iodide in the human body is vital. We do not need bromide. We need some chloride, but not chlorine as such, but some chloride from salt as well we never ever need fluoride so those are the four halogens fluoride the most reactive and most toxic Chlori flu fluorine chlorine bromine and then iodine iodine is vital for humanity fluorine is highly toxic chlorine and bromine are in between some of it is necessary but not in, 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 in high quantities and none of them should be breathed as gases anyway so that's potassium iodide in in water and when we turn on So that's the ox oxygen concentrator and a home ozone machine, basically. This can be used at home or anything else like that. And you start to bubble it through. And slow and gentle. If that was bacteria in there, you will see that, well, obviously not that you won't see bacteria, but the bacteria will, will be killed very quickly and the viruses. But the physiological activity of the of the ozone in that water is nice and gentle and slow so you can see the the yellowness happening there the iodine is being released that water is being oxidized at a much slower much gentler rate than everything else and again if you smell it instead of smelling ozone i can smell iodine being released can you see that there clearly cool oh and while while we're at this Some more ozonated water in here. Let's do the pH of that as well. Like I was saying, whoop, that's my iodine gone. We got heaps of it, don't worry. So that's ozonated water. Does it make the water acidic? And the answer is no. It's still well, it's alkaline water, it's got a few minerals in it, that water, because it came through a, through a filter. So it does not make the water acidic. Very important. Hydrogen peroxide, other than the exothermic reactions and, and all these things, is also very, very, very acidic compared to normal human blood, because we're looking at neutral, 77.5 for human blood. This is pH 4. You never inject hydrogen peroxide. Th this is another extreme that we keep seeing and, and hearing. Okay, so the medicals are not going to ignore ozone, ignore all this, ignore all this natural stuff. And on the other extreme, we see people, oh, let's drink hydrogen peroxide. Let's, uh, let's use hydrogen peroxide here and there. And I've even heard about somebody 
attempting to inject hydrogen peroxide. That's stupid. Anytime you take things way out of intelligent, intelligent knowledge and, and proper application of science, you get into, well, unintelligence, for lack of a better word, but a more better word is stupidity. So you're putting yourself at risk and doing wrong things, trying to be too natural or on the, on the medical side, trying to be too scientific, I would more say most of it ends up being dogmatic. So let's be intelligent. Let's do things intentionally with better imagination. Combine our science, do tests like this at home with your kids, look it up online, try whatever you wanna try. Just convince yourself, study, learn, understand, and convince yourself what is best and what is safest for me and for my family and for my world. And if you're a healthcare provider, for my patients, because that's what they trust you with. We're not here to save lives, guys. We're here to save quality of lives. We're here to care. We're healthcare providers. We're here to care for humans and help them heal and become better. And if we can't help them heal and we can't help them become better, at least we help them die with dignity. Healing in death is still as important and as effective to give that human being the dignity and the respect and the love that everything that we could do has been done. Putting them in a, on a ventilator while being sedated, and I hope we all know that by now, anyone who needs ventilation or is supposed to go on a ventilation has to be sedated first. So if they're not comatose, which is really why they need a ventilator, they, they have to be sedated. Now they're sedated, that has its own dramas, especially when they're old and sick, and that's usually who they are with the COVID-19, for example. Then the ventilator goes on, which is very high positive pressure, pressing on, on these lungs, pushing the fluids out, causing more damage inside, and they're all alone, and then they end up dying all alone with all that trauma. And even if they survive, they survive with many, many, many complications. This is not the way to treat human beings. We should care more. We should be more available. We should use better technology that's already known and science that's already out there and corroborate it and collaborate on it to really help these people heal. And if we can't help them heal, once we've tried everything, it's not okay to kill any human. It's not okay to ignore any human. That's what I'm saying. We have to care and do everything in our best abilities without causing damage. Have mercy on those people's souls. And if somebody's going to die anyway, they might as well die loved and cared for and respected and with those people, with those whom they love so that they can redeem their souls and so we can redeem our souls. With that, I'll leave you with love. I'll leave you with the intelligence and the intent to help humanity heal. And until I see you next time, always aim to look better, feel better, and be better. Thank you.